Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters, wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Today, I pray that's our, our heart, man, that your spirit would lead us. It is what gave birth to your church, it is what raised Jesus from the dead. And uh, God, there is power, there is your spirit and deep conviction that you desire uh, for your church, your community, your body. And so I, I pray today, man, we all walk in here with so many different burdens and issues and pains and hurts. But God, your Holy Spirit is so powerful and you desire to allow us to feel your spirit, to let your spirit live inside of us and to guide us. And so I, I pray today we'd, we'd have an ear to hear what your spirit is saying and a humble heart, God, to become less that you might become more in our life. And so uh, lead us today, Jesus, we ask in your name. And everybody it's said, amen. Cool. What a beautiful way. Then. What a beautiful way to open the morning, don't you think, with that worship and music, and it was fantastic. I, um, I wanted to read, just we're in the book of Thessalonians, the first letter that Paul wrote to Thessalonica, and um, as we do that, I was just thinking we're going to prepare to take our offering, but I wanted to read the first couple of verses to you. This is really a letter that Paul is writing back uh, to the church of Thessalonica. Think about it as the, the church of Kensington Clarkson, if you would, that a letter would be written. And Timothy went there and he reported back to Paul that everything was going amazing and great. Uh, in spite of all the suffering and issues they were facing, there seemed to be a power at this church. And, and so Paul opens the letter. He says, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. Can you imagine if just every time we spoke to somebody we opened up, we're like, hello, how are you? Grace and peace to you. It would change the whole tone and tempo, right? It says, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work that was produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And I thought of our church when I was reading the opening part of this, many of you that are generous here and you give here, but there is a, there's a faith work that we get to be about, right? We are taking missions trips. We are helping those in our community. We have recovery programs. We are preaching the good news. People's marriages are, are finding reconciliation. People are finding hope. People are finding their identity in Jesus Christ. Lives are being transformed. P people are in prayer groups all the time. Like this is like, I'm like, oh my gosh. Like we're, we're, we're like part of this right here. It's amazing. And it's a labor of love. I love that Paul illustrates that too. And it goes beyond that, that it's inspired by the work of the Holy Spirit, by Jesus Christ. And I, I pray that we would be a place as we continue to grow and we're growing, that we look and say, we are a people of faith. We are one that labor not by strife or toil, but one fueled by love. And we are a place inspired by the work and person who is alive and well named Jesus Christ. Uh, that's our heartbeat around here. And so I just want to thank you so much for those that have been generous to this work. You are giving into a living, transformative work called the church. And it's amazing. And no different that this church that Paul is writing to that we're learning from today, he's, we're, we're, we're learning from today too, even in our own church. And so it's amazing, this letter. Have you ever gotten a letter? How many have actually, when's the last time anyone actually got a letter? It was not from like a bill collector or something. Like an actual letter that somebody wrote you, right? Uh, does it, anybody? Anyone? <laughs> right? You have. Some people are still writing, right? Letters. And it's amazing. Now it's different with my kids. It's in a, you know, we're like, oh, we're just going to snap somebody. I'm like, that sounds rude. Like, no, dude, snap, Snapchat, you know, and like an Insta or a DM, a direct message or whatever. But in the early 2000s, we often used this thing called the email. <laughs> Our students don't have a clue what we're talking about with it, but how many still email a little bit? And, and so Marie and I, uh, when we had first met, we had met and got married within nine months. It was a kind of a whirlwind love story, a little bit, kind of crazy. We just met. I remember telling my dad, I'm like, well, we're engaged. He goes, you're what? <laughs> like, it happened pretty quick. But I remember I had only known her for a couple of weeks, and she had gone to Florida with her parents. And so I started sending emails to her because, like, text messaging wasn't as big of a deal then. And 
I wasn't going to write a letter. I didn't know if I'd make it on time to Florida. She was only there a week, so I would send her emails every night. And I would email in, man, listen, I was like the Casanova of emails. Or so I thought. And I was like emailing, like, you are so beautiful. I just, I love you and your hair and everything about you. And you're amazing. And I, I hope you're having a great time with your family and the son. But I wish I was there with you. And, you know, I'm just writing back and forth. And little did I, I'm writing all these emails every day. Well, Maria would print the emails. Her dad, her dad was an entrepreneur, so her dad always has like a printer and a computer, wherever they go with them. He'd print the emails. She'd go down to poolside with her family and friends that were all there, everybody else there in the community. All of a sudden, she'd pull the letter out and she'd begin to read it. <laughs> Before you know it, there's like 20, 30, 40 people reading these love letters that I thought were personal emails from me to her, right? And, <laughs> and I, I realized, though, as, I, as we grow in our marriage and our relationship that that words would not be enough. At some point, I'd have to put actions behind all the words that I'm writing, right? A little less talk and a lot more action behind those words if I'm actually going to get married and have kids and grow a family and do all the things that we're trying to do, failing at moments and succeeding in others, but that my heart goes back to this moment and my heart felt these words, it believed in these words that I was writing to her, emailing to her, but they would eventually need more substance to them, Right? And I realize that, and I, I realize even as I grow in the simple things in life, like I, I'll call sometimes, like, I'm coming home, do you want anything? No, I'm fine. I'm like, I'm going to grab this food because I'm working late or something, and I'm going to bring home, and I get home, and I have a meal. And she goes, did you bring me anything? And I'm like, no, because you said no. I asked you. Remember on the phone? Well, I figured you knew that I want something. <laughs> I'm like, well, I figured you'd say I want something when I asked if you wanted something, you know? And those moments, or sitting there and having an awesome, and I can tell it always Maria will venture off the menu, and I'll stick with what I know at the restaurant, and then she'll realize that she ventured too far off the menu and doesn't really like it, and she'll look at my plate and look at me and look at my plate and smile at me. I'm like, do you want a bite? She goes, only if you want to give me a bite. <laughs> you don't say no in those moments, fellas, right? So, but like learning and growing that there's more and more, there must be substance behind the words that I'm sharing. And what's incredible to stop and consider here is this thing that Paul is doing. He's writing a letter. He sent an email, if you would, and people are gathered around and they're reading it, but there's more than just that's going to happen from this one portion here. In fact, Paul says this, he says, for we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power and with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction, it did not come with just words. In fact, you and I every single day will read or hear collectively 100,000 words in one form or fashion or another, from a podcast to a letter to an email to a billboard to in, in a listening to the radio in a conversation, and we hear words, and they're in one ear, and like the phrase goes, sometimes out the other, and the words that really matter are the ones that have substance or weight. Now, words can hurt, and words can bring life. Words can be meaningless and words can have more meaning than we've ever understood. Words can just fall away and they can stick in our hearts. Words from a doctor reading a diagnosis. Words that are coming from the lips of the one that you love that's saying, I feel like we're in trouble and I don't know if we can steer in the right direction in a relationship. Words maybe that you're not hearing anymore from a child that has been gone for years from you and you just yearn for them to call you. To say, can we meet? Can we talk? Can we be together? Words that you are saying, and you're saying, would you forgive me? I can't believe I did this. Can we make this work in the words from their mouth? Or I don't know. And these words have power. There is life and death in the tongue, in fact. And there is substance to words. And Paul says, our gospel. He says, you've been hearing many philosophies in Thessalonica. This would have been a, a rich High income producing city. It would have been a place of great travel and commerce. It was a destination. I mean, there would have been multiple like languages and tongues and ethnicities and, and socioeconomic backgrounds and everything here in this moment. And Paul is saying, I know you've heard a lot of different messages and you've heard a lot of philosophies and you've heard a lot of words, but I want you to know something, even in this letter, though it is comprised with words, it is not just simply words that we came to you with, but power and the Holy Spirit and a deep conviction. 
And Paul says this is actually, these are the ingredients of the church. This is what's amazing about this church. And I would say this today. In this past week, I was telling Marie in the past just like five days, I've realized the church needs more power, more of the Holy Spirit, and more of a deep conviction than we probably ever have in the history of the church. So that's a big statement. If you would have seen the week I've had, maybe the week that you've had, and you would agree with me at this moment, you're right, Jeremiah, I think we do. Man, I could really, where could you really use more power in your life? Where could you use more guidance and, and more of a reality that God is not some mythical, ethereal thing we sing to, but he is real and present in your life. In the middle of the night when you wake up with anxiety, in the middle of the day when you're uncertain about your future, and you don't know how to figure your way through something, and the Spirit of God is guiding you like T.J. was saying, in all truth, like is he real in your life? And a deep conviction that causes you to be unmovable, that no matter what comes your way, you're saying, I'm in this to win it. Like I'm not backing down at all. And I, I say that, let that be our prayer today. Let that be our prayer throughout this year. To God, give us more of your power and your spirit and a deep conviction that comes from the two. God, will you help us with this? And so I want to take a second and just dissect this letter a little bit, not the whole thing, just even a few verses, a few words. And Paul engages in verse 4. We read up to verse 3. He engages in verse 4. He says, for we know. That word know means experientially. Like, Maria knows I love her if I'm willing to give her a bite of my food, right? She, she knows I love her if I'm willing to go above and beyond. If there's not just simply words, is it lip service you've been giving me, or is there action behind your words? He says, for we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, he describes us that way, loved by God, that he has chosen you. And it's amazing just to stop in this first part, just for a second, you are deeply loved. What does that mean? It's, it's an unconditional love. There's nothing that you can do to make God love you more, and there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. Did you hear that? It's easy to hear, hard to understand for me, I, honestly. There's nothing we can do to make God love us more. What if I show up more, and what if I serve more, and what if I give more? And those are great, but those should come from an overflowing part of your heart and soul because you know how loved you are by God, right? There's actually nothing you can do to cause God to love you more. He already infinitely, unconditionally loves you with everything inside of him. Like right now, towards you. And you say, but if he saw me, that's the beauty. He does and still loves you. This is what makes it grace that comes upon our sinful lives. And the other thing is there's nothing that you can do that would make God love you less. So what if I did this? What if, oh, you know. Because there's moments, because in our existence in humanity, we have done things where we say we're writing them off. They're no good. Don't ever go buy them. Don't ever talk to me again. I don't want to see you. I'm done with you. I'd, right? There's these moments we do. And maybe I'm not saying, I'm not against healthy boundaries for protective reasons or anything at all like that. That's not what I'm saying. But in our deep part of our heart and our soul that goes on to eternity, like we think, oh, there's some people that are just written off. And God says, no, 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 no. For God so loved the world. For God so said that there's nothing that they could ever do to cause me to love them more. In fact, I'm going to send my only begotten son because I love him so much. And there's nothing they could ever do to cause me to love them less. So how do you know on the cross, Jesus says, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. God, I don't want to hold this against them. Put all their sin on me. And if they put their faith in me, they can have salvation. Like, this is what's beautiful about Jesus. Paul says that, and then chosen. Mark Twain says it best, is the two greatest days of your life, the day you were born. We celebrate these all the time, birthdays, right? And the day you figure out why. He says you were chosen. Now Paul goes on. He says, chosen you. And you, you, you got to ask the question, why? Why did he choose me? Well, here we go. He goes, don't you remember? Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with, say this with me, power. Wait, two of you did that. That was fantastic. Let's try that again. <laughs> I was feeling that was going to be more where else. I'm like, wow. Power. With power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. Now this is a really powerful statement. Paul's saying this, and he goes on, but we're going to stop there and dissect really just the first part of these. The idea of power is a big deal. Th this concept of power is dunamis in the Greek. Origins from it, derivatives from it, go all the way to dynamite. There's an explosiveness to it. There's a significance to it. There's an overcoming power that they came with. Paul says that we came and we showed you this 
Because people would see this when they saw Jesus. They'd say, who is this man? The way that he speaks has authority. The way that he talks is with clarity and as if from heaven. But his power, it's unbelievable. And, the, and Paul and the disciples would come in the same form and fashion. And it's amazing. Have you ever had moments where you've just, you needed more power? <laughs> and and for, for years of trying to like work out and play sports and everything. And, and over the past couple of years, I'm, uh, my body has betrayed me a few times from a ruptured Achilles and broken bones and a torn groin and just all, uh, right? And I, I know it's like every time you think about that, but this moment where I, I, in lifting, you'll have this moment where you're warming up and you're going and you're going for all the power you have. And you're pushing and you're pushing everything you got and you look, I got it. And, and, and there will be a spotter there. And the spotter's saying, do you want help? And you're yelling back, I got it. And then you're, do you need help? And you're like, shut up, I can't talk. I'm you know, and you're in these moments. I, I know, it sounds crazy. I, I swear I'm a nice guy, but I have these crazy moments in the gym still where I'm trying to be 24 instead of knowing I'm 44. And we're, we're pushing like crazy. He goes, I think you need help. And I'm like, I don't need help. And finally the weight's coming down. I'm like, I need help, <laughs> right? Coming and, and the spotter or friend will jump in and give you help. And this is so much illustratively like the Holy Spirit. There, there's these moments where our life kind of looks like this right here. If we're on mission or we're trying to do something that we, we have like a screwdriver, right? And, and, and we're, we're going to the town with this. And, and then all of a sudden, this idea of the Holy Spirit Paul's introducing, it's like this, this power drill. It's like these are both like would do the job potentially. This would be goofy to do it like this without the power source in it. And there's this reality, uh-oh, I swear I've used one of these before, I got the thing, I got the thing caught in it, but there we go. If you need any handyman work, call me, <laughs> right? And there's this, this power, and I can remember one night working with my daddy at construction for a long time, and we were down to like two more sheets of drywall, and the power ran out, and there was like nothing more. And he goes, well, that's fine. We can just screw it in by hand. I'm like, okay, no problem. And like probably 10 minutes into it, my forearms were screaming at me. And I think sometimes in life, we live our way through this life as Christians where we've got like a form of godliness, but there's no power in us really. Like we go to church, we, we, we go through the motions, we've been giving them, and, and our form is good, but our power seems to be non-existent. Paul says, in fact, there's like, a power that comes when we're saved or when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. And we accept him. We, we put our faith and trust in Christ. He says it's such an incredible power, I'm not ashamed of it. He says it's a beautiful power. And he says because it's the power of God unto salvation in my life. And I stop and I just think about our lives that we don't live our lives this way. Like there's our life that we're living in, it looks in good form. We came this morning, we're gonna, we sang this morning, uh, we're, we're, we're preaching, we're learning the word of God this morning, but will we leave this place with no more power than we came into? Will we move on throughout our, our day and then hit Monday morning and we feel powerless? Where do you feel powerless in your life? Because Paul says, I, it's not simply our gospel is just one of words, but it's one of power. There is something incredible about it. He told Timothy, I've given, you know, there's a spirit upon you that is one of power and clarity and a sound mind, love. He said there's power in your life. And I stop and I think even about the verse that TJ read this morning before that song, Joy, which was amazing, wasn't it? A king and country. And in Romans chapter 15, verse 13, it says this. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Jesus so that your life and my life, our lives as a community may overflow, right, with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I, I mean, there's got to be this part of our life. People are flocking to Jesus. They're seeking Jesus. They're trying to get near Jesus because there was power. The woman that had a blood disorder, it says in Scripture in Mark chapter 5, just reached out, thought if she could just reach out and literally touch the cloak of his uh, you know, garments, she would be healed, and she was. There was power, and Jesus' power has flown out of me. Like, what happened? The disciples are like, are you kidding? But Jesus knew that he possessed power inside of them. There is a power to the gospel. Believe it or not, 
people don't always realize this, and we don't, so I always encourage you, if you need a Bible, we have Bibles back there. We would love for you to have them. I mean, I read out of this scripture. I, I, I do the Bible app. I do audio. I do the whole thing because there's actually power in this scripture. The Word of God is alive. It says of itself in Hebrews chapter 4, 12, it's alive and powerful. Like there's something significant to it. There's something amazing. It's not simply words that are sacred to a community that's made it across thousands of years of human history. Stop and think about that. If you started a club a couple thousand years ago and it's still rolling with hundreds of millions of members that all come around some words that you wrote down, wouldn't you ask yourself, is there more to this, right? And I'm telling you, there is. This is the word of God. Jesus himself says about power, he says, you can't even live by bread alone, but by the every word of God that comes out of the mouth of God, there's power inside of it. Just even when you read it and you, and you hear it, and Paul says it's not simply words, but power. And I just, I, I feel like in our lives so often, and I say this to myself, I'm not saying like, I got all the power in the world and you guys need more. Are you kidding? Not at all. Man, I fail all the time. I need more power of peace in my life. I need more power when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Give me wisdom in my life. The power of patience that is produced by the Holy Spirit in my life. Because if we're just like flowing and operating and there's no power and there's no real transformation in our communities here and online, right? And there's, there's no real substance. People aren't really doing what Paul said, like working their life by faith. There's a labor of true unconditional love that the power of the Holy Spirit is producing. There's an inspiration in each one of us that we're maturing to, we're growing to by Jesus Christ. Then we're missing all the point. Paul's saying all these other philosophies and religions, th there's vanity to them because there's no substance or depth. And he says there's no power to them. But I came to empower. My friend had toured the Ford Mansion. Etzel and Eleanor Ford have the Ford Mansion. Have any of you ever been there before? Uh, it's a beautiful, it's an amazing place. And uh, he went there, and that's the son of Henry Ford, the only son of Henry Ford. And, and, and my friend Nate, he's a worship leader at the Troy campus, and he was, he was cruising around, and he was walking around. And he, he, he goes there, he took his, his in-laws there for, I think it was their 46th anniversary, and they were celebrating, so they were going to go there and dinner. Then they see this first car they came to. They had all the model cars out. And they see this, and, and Nate's like, that's amazing. That car is so, I mean, he said to be there and see it, it was polished precise. It was almost as if you time traveled right back into the early 1900s and late 1800s and, and, and you were able to like actually go, this just came off the assembly line. It's unbelievable. And he said, and he told one of the workers, he said, this must be so cool to drive. You must, you must have loved pulling this out of wherever you store it and drove it here. And, and the kid goes, oh, we didn't drive it. We had to move it and all sorts of stuff. It, it doesn't work at all. And Nate goes, are you, are you a car from one of the greatest car manufacturers in the world doesn't work and it's on showcase right now. And he said, yeah, it doesn't work at all. He said, some of these cars you see have, have, were disassembled and reassembled. And he said, you're kidding me. That's like Nate goes, he feels like that was like an insult to Henry Ford himself. Like Henry Ford would have lost it if he was there. Like get these things to drive and let's take kids for rides in them, right? Like let's show this thing off, right? Like that's what he thought. And Nate said he was just sharing with that we've been talking over the past couple of days. He's preaching today, dude, probably doing a phenomenal job. This is a super talented worship leader, heart for Jesus, great preacher. And he says, I was going on a hike, and I took a picture of this years back, and I, and I realized somebody said that car had no power at all. He said it was really is about as good as this right here. <laughs> he said that's when it came to functionality. If it came for observation and form, that's great. Let's look at it. It's shiny. It's great. It's amazing. Can we take a ride? Nope. Can we go anywhere? Nope. Can we go pick up a pizza with it? Nope. Can we do anything with it? Nope, not at all, right? There's, there's no substance to it. There's no power to it. Never felt it. And he and I were talking. He said, it's almost a sad commentary of the modern church. Paul is saying, and he's writing this letter, he's saying, I see you. Timothy went back. We almost got killed by Caesar, so we had to leave. And I was worried you were going to fall away from your faith but I sent Timothy, because he was a Greek, so he could pass in there. He was not a Jew. He could make this free passage to Thessalonica. And Timothy reports back, Paul, it's amazing. There's power. There's the Holy Spirit. There's 
deep conviction. They've not given up the faith. They've only grown in the faith. They're doing good works and a labor of love and a, a work by faith. They're inspired by Jesus Christ. They know he's alive. And it's amazing to watch Paul. And hence, Paul writes the letter. I'm so inspired. You got it. It was not simply by words that you thought we were writing or what we were talking about, but by power and the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. And the church's commentary today often could be there's no power. It's all, it's all show and no go. It's like there's this form, but there's no, there's no power inside of it. And you say, why is this such a big deal? Because this can't be. Like, like, we actually have to be this church that's described in here. This was a church that Jesus promised would transcend from one generation to the next. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, it says that his love was the love of a generational God, that his love would go for many generations, thousands of generations. This church is supposed to be for your kids. This church is for your grandkids. This church is for your great-grandkids. This church is for your neighbors, right? This church is for our co-workers. This church is for anyone that is broken and busted. This church is the one that Jesus says, come to me, all that are heavy laden and burdened, and I'll give you rest. How? Because he was full of power. Like he had power inside of him. And, and we're part of this church too. And Paul says, don't miss it. Man, don't miss like what we're supposed to be part of. And Nate and I were talking, I'm like, this is crazy. We're not supposed to be that kind of church. And I said just a few minutes ago, I was reminded of that. Marie and I were talking in the past five days. I'm watching families be almost ripped apart by the enemy. Ready to give up. I'm talking to people that come to our campus. Come here to our camp. These are not fictional people. Come to our campus that are facing cancer. That they thought was in remission and now is coming back and it's coming back fast for them. I'm talking about people that we're going to visit at Royal Oak Beaumont on Tuesday morning at 8.30 in the morning because they had a massive surgery and they're still not out of the, the woods with it. I'm talking about decisions that you and I are struggling with right now that we have to make. We need power. We, 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 we need help. We need substance to the decision making process and all the wisdom in the world cannot help. We need outside power by Jesus Christ. And I'm just so reminded, I'm like, Paul, you are so right, man. Nate, that analogy was so right on. We, we, we can't be all show and no go. We can't be polished and pristine and, and like just presenting like no other and everybody goes, you gotta go check out Kensington Clarkson's awesome. Yeah, but do you have transformation in your life? Do you feel more loved by this person named Jesus? Are you sensing and feeling this next part that, that he's talking about, the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit is not just like this ethereal, mythical concept, this good feeling from God. Jesus says, it's better if I go. In, in the Gospel of John, he's laying out his final discourse, and he's telling his disciples who have followed him, who are ready to give their lives for Jesus, and who will change the world through the power of Jesus after he dies and is raised again. He says, it's better if I leave. You're, you're going to get the spirit of truth. He's going to come to you. And he's going to guide you, and he's going to love you, and he's going to encourage you. And they're like, don't go. What? Imagine if I'm just like, I'm out of here, but there's going to be a spirit that comes, and you're going to be in good hands. You guys would be like, you've lost it. <laughs> right? There's this moment we can think like that, but God's like, no, 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 because your spirit is a real person. You can actually grieve the Holy Spirit. It is a person. In the very beginning, God, when he created the entire world, this creative power says the spirit of God hovered across the faces of the water of the deep and gave form and creation to the worlds and universe. Like there is power and there is the Spirit of God here. And I love this, the Spirit of God is with us. Jesus makes a statement, he says, I'm going to be with you even to the ends of the earth. And the disciples are like, how will you do that? And it's because his Spirit was going to be with us. In the book of Acts, as it exploded, the Holy Spirit came upon people. People were baptized by the Holy Spirit, and they had the Holy Spirit come inside of their lives. They were renewed living believers with the power of God literally inside their lives. And he said, I'll be with you all the time. How is that possible for a person to be with you all the time? But people say, oh, their spirit is with us now. Jesus, I promise my spirit will be with you if you put your faith in me. And with us all the time. This happens sometimes at my house, like, 
where I'll wake up at 1.30 in the morning and I hear a little voice and I look over and I see eyeballs right next to my bed. Whoa! And it's one of our kids. <laughs> they're like the Holy Spirit's apprentices or something. You know, they're like, they're with us. They're here. <laughs> and now they're climbing in bed, <laughs> right? And here they are. And this idea of being with us. And it goes further than that. Paul says in Romans, says, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Not only is the Holy Spirit promised to be with us, with you and I through everything we go, he reminds us of all things. He guides us in all truth. I think one of the greatest things that our family, my mom, personally, I feel like has led, you've been such a great leader in our family, mom. You've led us spiritually when it comes to understanding this. A lot of times, she was going to AA programs and different programs, and it always says, I'm so-and-so, and I'm a recovering alcoholic, or not even recover. I'm so-and-so, and I'm an alcoholic. And it's identifying the sinful or the human nature, the flawed nature of who we are. But my mom's realized that my flesh, I am a recovering alcoholic, she'll say. But in my spirit, I'm a daughter and child of the Most High God. God has set me free from the grip of alcohol, right? There, there's, there's two stories to be told here. And I love this, that Jesus reminds us, he will guide us into all truth. In this reality, David says, I hide your word in my heart that might not sin against you. In fact, he says in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That word, the literal word, word there is referring to the word of God. In the Gospel of John, the word says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was God. It's referring to the spirit of God. David said, don't let your spirit flee from me. If your spirit returns to me, I'll be able to be, do things and know where to go. Have you ever felt lost? Maybe you feel lost right now. You feel lost in a relationship. You feel lost just in general direction of your life. You feel lost in understanding how to make things right that you, maybe you've made wrong. You, you feel lost in understanding how to find rightness and the wrongness that's been done to you. Whatever vantage point or nuanced place life has put you, the Spirit of God can guide you and say, follow me. Let, let, let me guide you. It's like maps on the car. Don't you love having maps? Have you ever asked yourself the question, what the heck, how did we get anywhere before maps? I do. I feel like I just would have gave up and pulled on the side of the road. Because <laughs> I'm already kind of bad with directions. And when we're driving, Maria knows, like there's a lot of things that I feel like, oh, you're doing great at that. Driving and getting somewhere is not one of those. It's like when you pass the exit, it's like, where are you going, where are you going, where are you you missed it. You, you, and she looks over and she's like, you missed it. <laughs> it's not a, oh, you, honey, you missed it. That was so silly. You missed it. <laughs> Stop. Like, what are you going to, like, you know, this is our, probably our point of tension. So I've learned, I'm like, I'm just not going to comment on that. I'm, I'm bad at that. But guiding us. And Jesus promises that he will guide us in all things. Says, But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you. In all the truth, he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. Stop and think about that amazing. He's only going to tell you truth. Have you ever had the broken tapes play in your head that tell you you're no good, you're going to keep failing, you can't figure this out? Don't you ever get aggravated at these things? Have you ever got so aggravated at the voices in your head that you get in a debate with yourself in the mirror in the bathroom in the morning? Have you ever, be honest, has anybody ever done that? You talk trash to yourself? You're like, who do you think you are? You, you're not going to write. And you're like, and if we hear our spouses or better half do this, we're kind of like, everything okay in there? <laughs> you know, are you all right? <laughs> Should I send in help, right? That moment, but there's this voice of truth that will guide us and show us things that are yet to come. This is what I think is really beautiful. I think God's given us a new, uh, a new senior pastor in Brian Mowry. I feel like there's this fresh wave of energy and power coming to our church. We're growing. Our campuses are growing. We're excited. We, we begin to pray for him like, hey, everybody, let's start praying for vision for our churches. Let's start praying for vision for this North Oakland County region. Let's pray for vision for the state of Michigan. Let's pray for vision, right, for our country. Let's start praying for vision, God. Give us this vision. Guide us in things that aren't here yet but are yet to come. To me, that's exciting, isn't it? I'm like, man, that is so cool to think the Spirit of God promises to do this. And he brings deep conviction. Deep conviction is an amazing final thought that Paul gives in just this excerpt, this first portion of this letter that we could teach through for probably a year. Honestly, it's so rich this letter, but just these few verses. He says, not simply words did I come with, but power 
You need this to have abundant life, to have the Christian life, to have the life that's going to give you forgiveness and mercy and love and joy, endurance and patience. And all that comes from the power of who? The Holy Spirit. He's with us all the time. And those things together all of a sudden start creating a deep, what is it? Conviction in you. Now, some of us, when we think about conviction, we're like, what am I convicted about? And some of us are very, we have a deep conviction about, you know, like things like, who likes the lions in here? Oh, nobody, wait a minute, look at that. There was a nervous fan, but I see you, and you're, you're con- there's a conviction, right? Hey, by the way, don't give up on the lines, and don't count them out yet. They sold out all their season tickets, right? Is that cool or what, man? I'm not even that big of a Lions fan, and I'm excited about that. What, we're clapping for the Lions and not Jesus. What's going on at our church? <laughs> right, they're, they're, but there's this power, there's the Holy Spirit, and there's this deep conviction, There's a deep conviction about the people. Paul is saying it's an earmark, it's a trait of who you are. And I love the song that the band is going to come out and they're going to help lead us in, the song, Who You Say I Am. Because all these things that we talk about and these ideas that we have, I I, want to show you this verse that Paul says. He says, many things the Spirit does. He says, the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, or you could use the word daughtership or family. You were on the out, but you've been made on the in, family, by Jesus Christ. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit of God teaches us and reminds us that God is not this guy on a throne with a big white beard that's untouchable, unapproachable, that's going to blast us from heaven if we screw up. He's one that says, I love you. And I care for you. I am deeply, madly, like just all for you. Like he says that, Father, we call him Abba, Father, which means daddy. It means daddy. We were with friends a couple days ago, and, and, their, and their daughters, since they've been little, call him Papa, and they still call him that. For some reason, when I hear the word Papa, I instantly think like Papa Smurf or something for half a second. I don't know why in my brain, but... But then I don't even know where that came from, so I don't know why I speak up here sometimes. But anyhow, <laughs> but I thought the, the good part of this moment that I was trying to get at is that it was so endearing. Like they knew that's their dad. That's their daddy since they were little, and that's going to be their daddy when they're 40 years old. That's their dad that they love, they know. It says the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now this is the part that's so amazing. Because all this starts, I, I look at Paul's scriptures, for we know he uses the language, it's familial, family, brothers and sisters, loved by God. The Holy Spirit, he's saying in Romans, it's going to remind you that you are a brother or sister in Christ. You are a daughter or son of the Most High God that the Spirit, Holy Spirit will remind you of. And this God, this Father is one you could call Abba. He's like Daddy. He's trying to give visual language and understanding to the human heart. This is daddy that no matter what you do or how you mess up, that you can reach out and he will love you and he will hold you and he will have great compassion upon you. He will forgive you. He will run for you. He will search for you. He will go after you. It says that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with what? Words, but also with power with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction of what? That when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are children of God. That's who we are. That we are not just a church. We are not an organization. We are not just some group of people trying to pull in the right direction or something like that, full of goodwill. And those are great things visually that people may see. But deep in our heart, we're like, man, we're a child of God. This is crazy. I think Marie and I are slowly learning and growing and understanding this more and more with our own children and even through the process of fostering and adoption. And, and our, our little daughter, Desi, her name is Elizabeth Desiree Roy, but she calls, she goes, I'm Elizabeth Desi Roy. And that's how she says it, right? And I remember growing up, me and my buddies would call me Wah. My last name's Roy, but Patrick Roy, hockey player, never followed hockey a lot. And they'd all call me Wah all the time. And I'm like, and they're like, come on, Wah. And I'm like, it's Roy. Why? I remember we'd get in big debates about it. And 
We call each other by our last names all the time, but anytime anyone would call my first name, they're like, is it Jerry? Is it Jeremy? Is it Jer? And my mom would be near mine. And she goes, it's Jeremiah. We named him that for a reason. I'm like, Sim, simmer down, mom. <laughs> you know, like a mom moment, mama bear moment. But she wanted people to know we gave him that name for a reason. Because my parents were coming out of craziness in their life and God was moving in their life and they named me that for a purpose and a reason. And Desi, it's amazing when we ask her, like, what's your name? And she'll go, Elizabeth Desi Roy. And I'm like, what's your name? And she's like, Elizabeth Desi Roy. And we get all excited, you know, and people think, what's going on in the house over there, you know? And you know, we're there and we're yelling, they're like, whose daughter? And she goes, I'm your daughter. And we get, we get excited. And in her room, man, there's this thing that says Elizabeth Desiree Roy and it's like a, a daughter of God completely loved. I mean, I wish I had it right now to read from it, like cherished and adored and prayed for and thought of. And I thought, this is amazing. Like, this is what's so beautiful about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has been dreaming of you and thinking about you and praying for you. I always joke with Maria, her mom said that she had prayed for years, for years since her daughters were born for their husbands. And often when Maria and I have tension, I'll say, I just want you to know I'm an answered prayer in your life. <laughs> God has been singing over you, praying over you, like sending his only begotten son for you, that you would put your faith in Jesus Christ. I would say the first and most important thing of your life you must understand is that you were called and invited. A price has been paid for your life to be a child of God. And if you don't know who you are in Jesus, none of the rest matters. More power don't matter if it's not from Jesus. More people, unless it's the Holy Spirit, doesn't matter. A deep conviction over the things in this world, they're good, but they're not what matters most. The things of God do. Who are you, really? Do you know who you are? Have you allowed the spirit of truth to speak deep into your life and say that you are a child of God? You are deeply loved. You've been bought with a price by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and he has made you family. He has given you access to the power of his kingdom his personal spirit in a conviction so deep it'll take you places you've never dreamed of or could think of. God, who do you say that we are as a community? I say that we be people that want to hear more from God and ask for more power, more of his spirit, and more of his conviction.